Hello, my name is Kees Snook. I'm from the University of Amsterdam and I'm happy to fill another slot in this tutorial on multimodality learning from videos and beyond. And I have as my title today, Video, Multimodality and Similarity. It's always good to look back and see what we have achieved as a community. So this is a video that accompanied the C3D uh, work from Dutronatol at, uh, at Facebook. It's already uh, a while ago, but it, it shows very convincingly what we can do in uh, trimmed action classification. So for each video, you will see what is the most likely activity that is happening according to uh, their methodology. And as you can tell, uh, often the, the, the number one pick is indeed uh, correct and very convincingly so. And even uh, the runner up uh, uh, classes are also often very relevant. So this is. Uh, uh, already in 2015, we could do this uh, very well. Here's another example uh, of uh, segmenting an actor and an action based on a lingual uh, description. So here the goal is to identify the woman in the purple dress uh, who is uh, running so, and identify all the pixels that belong to the, the actor and the action. So this is a very reasonable result given that it comes from a sentence uh, as input. And the nice thing about this algorithm is that when you change the sentence uh, and, and keep the video the same, and all of a sudden we are looking for the great dog who was running on the leash during the, the same dog show, uh, then the algorithm can figure out that it is indeed, uh, those are the pixels that belong to the, to the great dog. Uh, and while this may appear simple, there are note that there are many other dogs also in the background uh, visible. So the algorithm has really figured out uh, that this is the dog of uh, interest. Uh, here's an, uh, another uh, recent achievement. This is work from, from my team uh, that appears at ICV this week. Uh, and here we consider the problem of video relation uh, detection, uh, where the goal is to detect uh, an object, uh, a subject, and, and the predicates. And to do so by putting a, a tube or a box around uh, the objects of interest. So here we find the adult, we find the horse, and we also find uh, the, the predicates um, that is happening. So in this case, the adult cleaning, cleaning the horse. And also on this rather new type of problems, a lot of progress is being reported uh, lately. Now, I think the driving uh, force behind all this is, of course, advancement in uh, deep uh, supervised learning. So when uh, one composes a closed world uh, data set, or I would say a rather closed world, and adds uh, lots of uh, labels uh, to videos of interest, let's say action uh, classification, and you add class labels, uh, then with deep learning, you can get really get fantastic results. So uh, results will be state of the art. Um, you can impress uh, your, your audience, uh, but it still will be a rather relatively closed world. Um, the, the goal of video understanding eventually is to move into a, to a real world. And people are, are actively pursuing this uh, quest. And we are slowly uh, moving into this direction, attacking more and more complex uh, problems that we can infer from, from video signals. But here there's also a, a, a problem, which I like to refer to as the video understanding uh, paradox. And, and the point here is that as understanding becomes more and more specific, it is very unrealistic to assume that sufficient examples to learn from will be commonly available. So here you see frames from a, a video where somebody is trying to steal a, a bike in, uh, in New York City. Now you can imagine that at, uh, at some point you will build a detector that can identify uh, bike thieves um, that scans the street in front of your house to see whether your bike is still uh, there. The problem here is that it will be hard to collect sufficient examples of, of actors uh, performing the act of uh, interest because, of course, uh, the thief does not want to be caught on, on camera. So it will be very hard uh, to find sufficient examples to build such a detector. Uh, not to mention the fact that you also still have to label each individual box in all uh, the frame for a, a large variety of, of actors and thieves performing a similar activity or maybe you're also interested in uh, pixel level segmentation and you need to label every pixel in all the frames. And again, for a huge diversity of videos. 
or perhaps you're interested in, in causality to infer, hey, if somebody's walking around on the streets with a crowbar, maybe this is indicative for uh, an activity that is bound to happen. Um, all this requires huge amounts of, of annotations. So um, it is pretty clear that moving along this uh, direction um, for video understanding in the real world, which is highly dependent on, on supervision, is a, is a dead end. Uh, not to mention all the uh, ethical and computational uh, uh, constraints that come uh, with it. So the mission uh, should be to have real-world video understanding, uh, which is not as dependent on, on supervision as, uh, as today's uh, methodologies. Now, this is a big, uh, a big topic in the field, and there are lots of, uh, of angles uh, to approach it. So some, some recent developments in machine learning, uh, most notably self-supervised learning, where the inherent structure in, in the data is exploited as, as a label uh, to learn from, uh, very effective. Um, uh, Meta-learning that tries to learn not only uh, uh, a single task, but tries to infer from multiple tasks what is the best tactic to address similar tasks in, in the future. Another interesting line of, of research is domain uh, generalization, where uh, one has seen uh, a certain class in different source domain. Let's say uh, you have seen an elephant in photos, in art paintings, uh, and in cartoons. And the, then the goal is to build a classifier that can still infer the classifier on, on unseen target domain. So all of a sudden, uh, you see a sketch that has never been seen during training. And the task is to still be able to recognize the elephant uh, in this sketch uh, domain. So these all really help towards making uh, methods uh, more, more robust and eventually also much more data efficient. And we are seeing some, some work that's trying to combine uh, multiple of those uh, techniques, like a few shot uh, domain generalization uh, work from my team at, at iClear last, last year where we combine domain generalization and, and meta-learning uh, to learn classifiers uh, for only a few shots of examples and which are still able to generalize uh, to unseen domains. Okay, but today I want to talk about uh, another topic. So in, in reaching the mission of real-world video understanding that is not less dependent on, on supervision, uh, today's topic is uh, multimodality and, and similarity. And I will discuss those uh, two topics um, uh, based on two, two recent papers from my team. So first, I would like to talk about motion similarity. And in the second part, I will cover also audiovisual uh, similarity. So for motion similarity, um, we're looking into a paper that appears uh, this week at ICCV. It's called Motion Augmented Self-Training for Video Recognition at Smaller Scale by Kirill Gavriljuk uh, from University of Amsterdam, together with Mihi Jane and Ilya Karmanov from Qualcomm AI uh, Research. And in this paper, we set ourselves uh, the following goal. We want to self-train a model that can be effectively fine-tuned on small-scale data sets with around 10,000 videos. And it is well known that such small-scale video data sets benefit much more from uh, motion uh, than appearance. Uh, and the reason is that there is too much information in, in, the, in the RGB uh, uh, to learn from with only a small set of uh, small data set, and uh, the much more sparse flow uh, signal is much more informative. Um, but flow has a downside, and flow computation affects efficiency, which is often what you don't want if you're in, in, in a small-scale scenario on a compute uh, budget. So we set ourselves as a, as a goal to train a network using optical flow, but avoid computation of the same flow during inference. And, and I will explain how, how that can be done. So the standard tactic in, uh, in problems like action classification is to take a hugely labeled uh, data set, let's say the latest version of, of kinetics, you train your uh, favorite uh, uh, CNN, and you try to predict uh, uh, clips, trimmed clips, that come with an associated uh, label that has been provided by human annotators. Now, by doing so, you learn a uh, reliable uh, uh, network with reliable uh, weights, good initialization, 
And then when you move to a, uh, a new data set, let's say UCF 101, a small scale one, um, you use the same network architecture with the pre-trained weights, and then you start to fine tune those weights further with additional annotations that have been provided on this uh, additional data set. Now, the shortcomings uh, of this approach are, are rather clear. It requires large amounts of human annotated videos uh, to pre-train. Um, also, it treats different video representations like RGB and, and, and flow, and, and also audio for that matter, uh, uh, mostly equally. So the contributions we're making here is uh, a, an architecture we call uh, motion fit. So this is a motion augmented self-training uh, procedure. And what it does is transfers optical flow information to an RGB model uh, via a self-training procedure on unlabeled video data. Uh, we've presented an empirical study to discover what form such video pseudo labels uh, should take at a smaller scale. And we will demonstrate that this can really boost accuracy on, on small scale video data sets. So the motion fit model works as uh, follows. We have uh, a small uh, data set from which we extract optical flow uh, motion representation. Then uh, we, we train a motion uh, model uh, using a small amount of, of human labeled uh, classes, let's say some action classification problem. Let's say we do some uh, action classification on, on UCF uh, 101. So based only on the flow information. Uh, and, and doing so, we learn the fine motion changes rather than repetitive and abundant appearance details that may appear in backgrounds and so on. Um, we introduce a multi-clip uh, loss and this is essentially splitting uh, a trimmed video into multiple uh, short clips. And we treat, uh, we assign the video label to each of those clips. And we try to optimize uh, uh, in this way. The idea being that the action of interest may happen uh, only in a part of the video or be really uh, emphasized in a small part of the video. And by doing, uh, by learning it in this way, we better capture uh, the fine uh, and descriptive details of the optical flow. So we really capture the foreground information, so to say. Okay, this is step one. And this gives us a uh, what we call a motion pseudo-label uh, generator. So a model that is trained on optical flow only. Then we move to a big uh, source uh, data set, let's say kinetics. But here we don't use the human annotated labels. So we just use a large amount of, of video. We again compute uh, the same optical flow features on this data set. And then with our pre-trained uh, model from step one, we start to extract features uh, from these, uh, this large video data set. Um, then we introduce uh, different ways of temporal modeling of those features. We cluster them just using simple uh, Euclidean uh, k-means with Euclidean distance to obtain pseudo labels. Then we turn our attention to the, the same data set, but then extracting appearance features. We use uh, an appearance network of our likings. And we again, what we then try to do is use the pseudo labels obtained from the motion branch and try to predict for each input clip how well it can uh, predict this pseudo label. And again, using the multi clip uh, loss. So we consider three levels of temporal granularity here. So clip, uh, segment, and uh, video level, where segment can be some semantic uh, uh, identification of temporal extent. So the pseudo labels are obtained after k means clustering of the motion features from, uh, from this data set, uh, the source data set, and then we are trying to predict it based on appearance. So this is where the, uh, the motion augmentation happens, so to say. Interestingly, we, are, we do not need to use the same uh, architecture. So for the flow features, we, we can use a different network architecture than for the RGB uh, architecture because they act on, on different uh, streams. They, the only thing they have in common is that this one tries to uh, uh, create 
clusters of pseudo labels, and this one wants to predict uh, those pseudo labels. Then we can uh, change our attention to downstream tasks. So we have a small scale uh, target domain. We extract appearance features. Then we apply our RGB uh, model that we trained in step two. And we have, again, with this data set, a small amount of class labels for which we then can fine tune our model to the task of uh, interest. So let's say action classification or clip, uh, clip retrieval. Okay, so this is the, the basics of the model. And uh, what I have now shown is how you can augment an RGB uh, appearance model uh, using optical flow in, an, in, an, in a, in a self-training uh, way. So on this big source set in the middle, we don't need any labels. That is the main benefit. So here are some implementation details for the experiments I'm, I'm going to uh, detail. So it is well known that uh, both UCF 101 and ASMDB 51 are, are too small for the direct training of a 3D CNNs on RGB information only. Um, so we use those, uh, uh, we use UCF 101 as our source set for the motion pseudo label generator. Uh, we extract TVL1 uh, optical flow and we train uh, a model here on the R2 plus one uh, D18 uh, uh, layered uh, backbone. Uh, from Dutron at all from CFPR 2018. Then for step two, we rely on uh, Kinetics 400, but without uh, its human uh, provided labels. We extract again the optical flow and also the RGB features. And for the optical flow, we again rely on the R2 plus one uh, E18 backbone. And for the RGB uh, network, so this one over here. Uh, we vary between two backbones, the, uh, the same one that we use for the optical flow, but we also explore an S3DG uh, network by uh, Qi et al. from ECV 2018. Uh, and here again, the small scale data sets on which we report are UCF 101 and ACNDP 51. So here are, uh, is our first ablation study that shows the benefit of this motion representation uh, on UCF uh, 101. So uh, we directly train a model here on, on, on UCF 101 training set and we report results on, on, on the test set to, in, to, to show the benefit of having a motion rep representation versus an appearance uh, representation. And as you can see from uh, those results, uh, when we train on, on motion on this small scale data set, it is really much better, up to 30% better than uh, appearance for the settings that we uh, evaluated. Now, then we have this multi-clip uh, loss uh, where we, we separate each individual video clip into one, two, three, or four uh, uh, subclips, uh, each uh, covering uh, 16 frames. So as you can see is that multi-clip uh, training is even better than using uh, a larger input temporal extent. So for example, uh, compare uh, the 32 uh, clip, uh, the 64 clip length over here, which scores 81.1 uh, uh, in terms of motion representation. And if we have only two clips already, uh, which is 32 frames in total, we, we surpass this 64 frame uh, clip length. So this multi-clip uh, loss is, 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 is effective too. And, and we recommend to use three, three multi-clips. Then we also ablated uh, the motion augmented self-training. Um, so here we looked into what is the temporal granularity that we should use to create these uh, uh, pseudo labels. So we used an entire uh, uh, video uh, we also tried uh, action uh, bytes from work from CFPR uh, 2020. Uh, we tried the TSN, Temporal Segmentation Network, uh, that scores 77.3. And we also did uh, the, the multi clip based approach um, that we have been the simple approach. And interestingly, this beats the more uh, advanced semantic partitions uh, of, of a video, as well as the, the regular video level. Then we looked into the number of clusters to, to pick for the pseudo uh, labeling. 
and also what is the influence of the amount of, of, of data, uh, unlabeled data that is available to create, uh, to create the clusters. Now, what we found is that motion fit is not so sensitive to the number of clusters. So as you can see, moving from 128 to 1600 uh, clusters does not change uh, the results too, too much. Uh, in, in fact, here it even starts to uh, deteriorate probably because of overfitting uh, effects. But in general, we see that 128, uh, we don't see much benefit beyond 1,000 uh, beyond thousand clusters. Um, of course, uh, providing more data uh, for the clustering is beneficial. So when we switch from the kinetics validation set to the kinetics training set, which is a factor five in amount of data, uh, one can see that the results uh, get a good, uh, good jump. Then we compared uh, our motion augmented self-training procedure with, with other uh, motion uh, knowledge transfer uh, approaches. Uh, so we compared with MERS and, uh, and MARS, and these are supervised approaches. So we adapted them to our, uh, uh, to our setting. Um, and where you can see is that um, our approach outperforms these approaches by a good margin on both UCF 101 and HMDB uh, uh, 51. Uh, and more interesting is that we are even outperforming other knowledge transfer uh, methods that rely on additional uh, ImageNet uh, labels. So we get a, we get a good results uh, here. Here's another uh, comparison with, again, self-supervised uh, uh, work where we compare against multimodal and, and, and vision-only uh, self-supervised approaches. So on the top are the multimodal uh, works and in the green uh, uh, box, the, the vision-only approaches. And what you can see is that motion fits, uh, even when using exactly the same uh, back power number of frames and, and resolution, uh, outperforms most vision-only uh, methods. So we are uh, state-of-the-art on, on UCF 101 and competitive on HMDB uh, 51. And interestingly, we are also on par with several of the multimodal uh, approaches. So th this essentially shows that there's a lot of promise to also include uh, other modalities in the motion fit uh, 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 regime. Uh, we saw the same behavior for uh, clip retrieval as a downstream uh, task. I'm not going to show the table, but I'm going to show you some success and uh, failure cases. So here are the queries and here are the top three retrieved uh, videos. So in green indicates we found uh, a, a correct uh, clip and, uh, and red indicates that we found a wrong clip. So essentially a clip that belongs to a different action class. It is interesting to look at the failure cases uh, over here, uh, where we notice that while our model may retrieve videos from different action classes, it still somehow captures distinctive motion patterns like hand motion and, and human poses that RGB uh, only models cannot, cannot capture. So uh, conclusion for part one on, on motion fit, uh, it transfers motion similarity to an appearance network via a self-training uh, procedure. It does not require costly optical flow computation during inference, just RGB, uh, but you will get sort of like the augmented uh, flow uh, for free. And it is especially well suited for deployment on small scale video with uh, compute budgets. All right, that concludes uh, part one. So now I would like to move to uh, part two, where we're going to look into audiovisual uh, similarity. And this is work from uh, CVPR uh, this year, together with uh, Yun Wa Zhang and Ling Ling Xiao. So here we look at repetitive motion, and visual repetition is a, actually a very interesting phenomenon that is uh, ubiquitous in our world. It appears in human activity like sports and, and cooking, but also animal behavior like a bee's uh, waggle dance, uh, natural phenomena like leaves in the wind, and also in, uh, in urban environments like flashing, uh, flashing uh, traffic lights. And estimating such visual repetitions is, uh, from realistic video is really challenging. 
Now, many people in, 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 in vision have attacked this uh, problem. So we, we, we found papers that are easily date uh, 20 years, uh, are easily 20 years old, and probably there's more if you dig, uh, dig deeper. Um, and what people have done in those, I would say, early, early days is to represent the video as a one-dimensional fixed period Fourier signal uh, that preserves the repetitive motion structure. Now, for such a strict assumption uh, to work, uh, they had to assume that um, the video they are working with was static and stationary, because it's basically inept for an open and, and uh, a real world. So here you see that uh, exemplified by uh, a video of a rower uh, who was all of a sudden accelerating and this is plotted in the time frequency space uh, over here. So there is an acceleration uh, of the of the rower, and this uh, and this appears as a shift of the maximum power in the time frequency space. And the Fourier transform is unable to handle such non-stationary motion. Now, for the non-stationary world, we we have worked on uh, wavelet transforms of uh, optical flow features. And how, how did we go about? We first segment the foreground uh, motion. So that is the top row with the blue segments. Then uh, we compute some optical flow, the, the yellow arrows uh, that, that are visible. We extract uh, several zero to first order flow uh, signals and four of them are shown uh, over here. Um, and finally, we de decompose them all into a time frequency spectrum using the continuous wave transform. And then in the bottom row, you can see a dashed black line which denotes the minimum cost path and an orange line indicates the maximum power path for counting by by integration and by doing so we could count the number of repetitions uh, uh, in video including non-stationary videos now this is using rather traditional signal processing techniques um, uh, and we got we, we published this in cvpr 2018 uh, and in uh, years after, uh, in CFPR 2020, two uh, works proposed uh, a deep learning based solution to repetition estimation in, in video. Uh, and of course, what is needed is large data sets. So uh, two data sets uh, were proposed uh, that year at CVPR. One is uh, Countix by folks at uh, DeepMind. And the other one uh, is by Zhang et al, who introduced uh, UCF Rep as a sort of like an additional annotation on top of uh, UCF uh, uh, 101. So the, the data set here comes with, uh, let me play it, uh, with repetitive actions together with the, the count. So how, how often does a repetition repeat itself in, in a video clip? And um, because this large scale data set now all of a sudden was available, of course, deep learning uh, can show its, its power. Now, here are some video examples uh, that are hard in repetition estimation. So I will show you some example. So these are real world challenges that appear uh, once you take in, uh, a classifier out of his training environment and, and let it go in the real world. So the first one showed low resolution. This one shows a person on a trampoline uh, in the dark. Um, this is a tennis match, and we are counting the repetitions of, of the tennis players, but all of a sudden the actor of interest appears out of, the, out of sight. So this is very challenging uh, for visual solutions. And this is the effect of camera motion. So how can you still count the number of repetitions when the camera follows, uh, follows the ball. Very cluttered scene, so very complicated where to look. This is also an interesting uh, one. Uh, the scale of the swimmer changes. And last but not least, a very fast uh, motion, so very hard to count uh, precisely the number of repetitions that are happening. So we reconsidered uh, this approach and we, we made three contributions. 
So we looked at video repetition estimation from a new perspective based on not only the site information, but also the sound signal that accompanies a, a video. Um, we proposed the first audiovisual model uh, for repetition estimation in, in video. And um, to further facilitate research in this direction, uh, we reorganized and repurposed two uh, sight and sound datasets for video repetition estimation. Now, this is the basic model. So from, from the highest level, it has a side stream, which is simply an S3D net that predicts counting result per input clip and a repetition class. A repetition class is a sort of like a latent number of, of classes uh, that are optimized during, during, during training, where you try to fit a video in, into one of these uh, latent classes and then uh, predict the number of repetitions. The idea being that different activities show different uh, uh, behavior. Uh, we do the same for the sound stream, uh, but here we use the ResNet 18, uh, predicting the counting results per sound spectrogram. And again, uh, using this latent repetition class. Uh, then something that is special for this architecture is the temporal stride uh, module. And what this does is that it selects per stride, or the best stride per video for the side stream based on visual and audio features. So the number uh, of repetitions varies uh, per video and you can, one can use the audio information to uh, estimate what is the best temporal stride to capture uh, a cycle of a repetition so that you can uh, recognize it well. And then last but not least, we have a reliability module uh, that decides what prediction uh, to use. So whether to rely on, on the sight or, or the sound. And this is especially useful uh, when the visual circumstances are, are, are too bad to make a reliable decision. Um, this is the global overview of the model. This is the uh, slightly uh, more involved uh, version of it. I think I'm going to skip going over all the implementation details. There is a QR code on the, on the top right uh, where you can find uh, the accompanying source code uh, for the model. Okay, we also repurposed and reorganized the Countix uh, dataset as proposed by uh, DeepMind at CFPR 2020. And uh, we selected uh, for the Countix audiovisual uh, version about 1900 videos covering repetitive activity categories with clear sound and without uh, background music so that we had a real a good set to evaluate uh, the value of sight and, and sound with an accompanying train file and test uh, partitioning. We also created a, uh, a test set, a challenging test set, which we call Extreme uh, Countix uh, Audiovisual. And this data set contains 156 videos from Countix AV and another 58 videos from the VGG sound uh, data set in which the site conditions are too poor uh, for counting so that we really force uh, the model uh, to look uh, to to listen to the sound. Now here you see some samples from this data set. I will show some some more videos uh, at the end as well. So first we are uh, ablating the, the benefit of the different model uh, components and we are reporting the mean average uh, error. So uh, we are predicting how often does a count repeat itself in the video and we compare this uh, with the ground truth and report uh, uh, the average error. So the lower uh, the mean average error, the better. So for the sound stream, uh, for the site in the sound stream, we see that uh, the sound by itself is worse than uh, sight. Uh, if we add sight with a temporal stride, which is also using the audio uh, uh, features, the mean average error gets reduced uh, a little bit more. Then for the fusion, we could rely on simply, simply averaging the predictions of the sight and the sound stream. Uh, but we found that having this reliability module um, uh, lowers the mean average error a little bit uh, uh, more. So all our modules uh, matter and the liability estimation is preferred over simple averaging. Now, then we have a big com comparison 
table uh, where we compared our model uh, with the ones that have been published in, in the literature. Uh, and what we can see here from this table is that on the, on the site-only data sets, our site-only model already outperforms all the state-of-the-art uh, uh, models for both uh, UCF, REP, and uh, Countix. When we rely on sound only, uh, that is not really competitive on these site-dominated uh, uh, data sets. But if we combine sight and sound, also on context results uh, uh, further uh, improve. Now, more interesting is to look at the sight and sound uh, data sets, where we see uh, slightly different behavior. So the Countix AV data set um, is really a data set where sight and sound are, are treated equally, because we know that the sight conditions are quite uh, uh, reliable and also the sound conditions are reliable. So this uh, again it shows that side by itself is better than uh, sound but if you combine the two you get a benefit and then in the extreme Countix uh, data set that is really optimized for poor vision conditions but reliable uh, sound we can see that uh, sound all of a sudden starts to outperform uh, sight and again the, the combination uh, reduces the error. So let's dive a little bit deeper in this extreme Countix AV data set because we also separated this uh, data set uh, according to uh, several uh, real world uh, challenges. So, for example, we identify those videos that have a huge uh, camera viewpoint change or a very cluttered background, a low elimination, fast motion, uh, disappearing activity, scale variation, low resolution, and so on. And what we see here is that sound is much less sensitive than sight for these visual uh, uh, challenges. And the combination of sight and sound always outperforms uh, sight only. So that is, uh, I think, an interesting observation. Um, and now let me show you some uh, videos together with, with the sound. So here you see the video here, the, the prediction of the number of repetitions given the side stream, the sound stream, and the combination as well as the ground truth. So this is a low resolution video, but the sound is quite reliable. Somebody turned off the light, but the trampoline jump has a very characteristic sound. And despite this actor walking away, out of the camera view, the sound continues as usual. Camera motion has no effect on sound. And also the visual clutter is ignored. So does Fast motion and the sound can still figure it out. So that, that brings me to the end of today's talk. Uh, Real-world video understanding with limited supervision is really a grand uh, a challenge. And in, in, in this talk, we highlighted only two aspects of, of, of interest. So one is, is motion and the other one is audiovisual similarity. And interestingly, they are all both naturally embedded in uh, learned representations. So there is really a benefit. Uh, you can still learn reliable representations also using uh, data, data efficient uh, methods. And I really believe we have only started uh, to explore the opportunities of this exciting uh, problem. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And should you have uh, any questions that you would like to ask me, please uh, contact me via the following uh, means. And with that, I would like to close and thank you and enjoy the rest of this tutorial. <laughs>